Right, okay, yeah, so um, I'm Andrew Haig. Um, I used to write video games for about 25 years. I worked at a company called Codemasters many years ago, made a game called Colin McRae Rally. Uh, and then I moved from there, made a few games for Lego, and then I made a few games for different children's TV shows and things. So then I got a bit bored of making video games. So now I teach um, computer science at the University of Warwick. Uh, I kind of had a massive career change, but that was okay. I've been there about two, I've been in computer science for about eight, six months, but uh, I've been teaching at Warwick for about two years. Um, and so I've had a BBC Micro since I was about uh, 11 or 12 years old, as you'll see in my slides. Uh, but I never had an Acorn Atom, so I always wanted to get one. So then I decided to learn about the Acorn Atom by uh, writing my own. So I've kind of already said something about what's on my slides, but I'll move to the slides then. Uh, okay, screen share. No desktop tool on there. Then. Okay, hopefully that's good. You can see that. Um, so yeah, so I've already explained something a little bit about myself. Um, let's move on to the first slide. So, yeah. Okay, so back in 1980, if you can cast your minds back, I I went to a my dad took me to a hi-fi show uh, where they had Sony Walkman and so on. Uh, but they also had some computers there. This was at the Helen Towers Hotel in Sheffield. I, was, I lived about 10 minutes walk away from Sheffield's Helen Towers Hotel. It's been knocked down since, but it's a very exciting building. And I went along. And they had uh, an Acorn Atom there, which I saw being demonstrated. I, they had some games on it, which interested me. I think they had some apples there, but they had the spreadsheets on, which I didn't find very interesting. And then they had uh, the EA, EA Video Genie, which is a bit like a TRS-80. That was playing Star War, which is a Star Trek type game. So I was very excited about seeing these computers. I'd never seen a computer before that, other than in James Bond movies. And they had just big wheels and things. So, uh, so I pestered my dad for a couple of years. I got all the books on computers I could get. So I got read lots of things. And then he decided to get me a BBC B, because that was the big thing. So I had a BBC B, but I still wanted that Video Genie or a Acorn Atom, but you can't ask for two or three computers when you're 12 years old, so I didn't. Uh, I just got my beam and I got really into that. Did some games on there, just on my own kind of basic games. And I tried to get things published in the B-Book magazine, but they just always rejected me, so I was a bit downhearted about that, but I just carried on. Um, in 2002, when I was working for a games company here in Warwick, I live in Warwick now, or near Warwick, um, I met a guy called uh, Simon Goodall, Goodwin, Simon Goodwin. Uh, he used to write for his Crash magazine. A uh, big uh, spectrum kind of guy, but he had an Acorn uh, Video Genie and he said uh, it doesn't work. If we can fix it, I can keep it. So I fixed it and I kept it. Uh, we had two, so he took the other one and fixed that one for him as well. Um, then um, I still want a BBC or an Acorn Atom. Uh, I never managed to get one. I keep going onto eBay and putting bids in, and I've got a kind of figure in mind of what I want to pay, but they always go a little bit more than I want to pay. So I think, mm, okay, maybe I'm going to have to stump up a bit more cash at some point. I don't mind if it works or not, I could probably fix it um, with a bit of help. Um, so I still wanted to play with an Atom, so I thought I'd uh, have a look online. And I looked online, and there aren't that many. Uh, I routed around the internet. There's some Acorn Atom emulators, clearly there are, but I've got a, a Macintosh here. And I've got some beads, uh, no, some um, PCs around here, so I uh, do use those occasionally. But I, I did use PC for a long, long time, but I kind of moved to Mac in the last uh, five or six years. Um, so JSB was out there, brilliant. I have to do BBC on my um, on my browser, but I couldn't really find an Acorn Atom emulator on the browser. I probably didn't look hard enough. I kind of, I think in the back of my mind, I wanted to always write a, an emulator. So uh, there's one of Phil's place. I've got a link for that later on, um, which doesn't have any tape or disc support. It's basically emulating the the, the Atom and nothing else. And then I looked again. I found that emulator. That's not uh, online. Found MAME, again the R line, it's useful for kind of looking at the source, both of those are great for looking at the source, but I thought right I'm going to undo, I'll take the JSB uh, and I'll, it's got most of the same wiring so I'll, I'll, I'll use that as a basis. It's got some very similar, architecturally very similar to the BBC Micro, the Acorn Atom, so it should be okay, it's a 6502, it's all memory maps, it's wired up very similarly in my view, um, can't get too far wrong. So then I, um, thought to myself, all I need to do to get this working, by looking at some of the, the doc, hardware documentation, I thought, I just need to take the 6502, create a PPIA chip, replace the 6845 with a 6847, da, 
I shouldn't be too hard. Sounds even simpler because it's not to write a chip for it. I'm not going to write the, the sound chip. I just have to do one bit of sound directly. That's pretty easy, I thought. And so JSB is also great because it can cope with loading tapes, the UA, UEF tapes. So that's all I want to do, load a couple of tapes, play a few games. That's, that's fine. I thought to myself. Um, I noticed you could paste into JSB. That's really good for testing. I can just copy and paste some, BBC, some basic code in, uh, and that would be great. Uh, as a debugger, now I think if you saw the talk by Matt Goldbolt last month, you'll think you remember that debugger was a big point for him. And I think I'm really grateful for him having made the debugger because it did really help me just even just to get that first call to the um, memory and to grab that first bit of data from the kernel, the atom kernel, and see what it's doing. You can see that it's actually re reading through the, the bytes and then it's, uh, it's, it's interpreting those and running it. So that's really good. So I'm really grateful to. Um, uh, Matt and all the, all the people helped him with that as well to get that developed. So I just wanted to be an add-on to JSB. So I selected something you could select from a menu. So it go BBC Micro, BBC Master, Acorn Atom. So I always started out with this in mind. I thought, well, I'm going to try and make JSB work. But I'm not going to destroy JSB. I'm going to keep JS Atom working. Uh, so here's my steps to success. So first of all, learn JSB. Secondly, learn about the Acorn Atom. Because uh, I've never used an Acorn Atom, so it's not like I knew anything about it really. I just know I wanted one. Um, uh, I'd like to learn to do some of the easy things. So 6502, very easy. When you'll see later on, I'll, uh, I don't go into too much detail in this talk, but I, 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 uh, the 6502 was really easy. I did it in like half a day, a couple of hours really. 6847, text, again, pretty easy because uh, getting text onto screen was quite easy. Pasting the code in. That was easy because that's already been done by Matt. Uh, PPIA for keyboard, again, pretty easy. It's just uh, detecting the keyboard and then sending the right signals down a wire. Um, difficult things were though, I thought was the tape. Um, another thing that was really difficult was getting the 6847 chip working to, to use what was already the 6845. When I talk about it a bit later, you'll see why I had a problem. And then one bit sound was a problem as well in the end. Uh, just because of timing it trying to get things running as quickly and, and, and neatly as, as, as possible to get the best sound really hard um, so make sure things i hadn't planned to do actually um, which i did was the mmc so that's the memory card uh, software when i saw um hoglets so or dave's uh big software archive i thought well i've got to get that in there that's going to be brilliant for everybody to see and use um, what's next get it combined with jsb um, maybe put the SID chip in because I know a lot of the archive has a lot of the um, uh, sound support for, for sound software for the SID chip. More URL support. I didn't really do anything with that. So if you type in um, disk equals elite.ssd, it'll try and load it up and then the atom will just get set. So there's stuff I've not really tried to hide away from the Beeb, JSB. Um, what's not next? Floppy disk emulation, I might do it at some point. I did think about it as I was writing these slides. Um, maybe I'll do the floppy disk at some point, but it's not a priority at the moment because we've got the SSD, uh, you know, the SD card stuff in MC. Um, and the snowstorm, I was showing this to, to, to Simon Goodwin, uh, and he said, oh, have you emulated the snowstorm? And he said, uh, I said, no, what do you mean? He said, well, whenever you use the real Atom and you try to um, uh, use the uh, right run programs on it, you just get lots of screen interrupts. Uh, and lots of white pixels everywhere. So um, at some point I might try to implement that since we're trying to be uh, accurate. Okay, so I played around with the JSB code a lot. That was the first thing. Um, mainly just to understand the debugger, because I didn't even know how the debugger worked in JSB. If, you press, if you're not sure, not familiar with it, you can press, I think it's Alt or Control S, and it brings up the debugger. Depends on your keyboard, if you, a PC might be different to the Mac. Um, I got so kind of muscle memory and I forgot which one it is. I just kind of did it from then on. And then you can step through code. Um, that was quite useful. Um, I tried to understand the 6845. I still don't really get it, the 6845. And I said I used a BBC, but for me, it was just using the basic a lot of the time. I didn't really, I did some 6502 coding, but I never really got into the nitty gritty of it before I moved on. Uh, best to get the keyboard code, because I know the keyboard, really going from the PC or Mac keyboard through to the, um, to the emulator. Um, I had to learn JavaScript. I'd never I'd done a bit of JavaScript. I understood the syntax. I mean, you write a lot of software in lots of different languages. You tend to learn the, the similarities between languages in terms of the syntax. But jQuery, 
underscore, bootstrap, promise, all of these are libraries that you've included into JSP, but I didn't know what they do, and I still don't know what they do, really. I kind of roughly understand jQuery. Um, that's it, I think. A little bit of jQuery, I think I understand that. But there's the, uh, yeah. So I picked an IDE because I wanted to do something where it would tell me where I was making mistakes. I didn't want to try and look at all the mistakes and go, well, I'm struggling to understand just the, 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 the syntax. So WebStorm from JetBrains was my uh, IDE of choice. It's pretty good. Uh, I had some problems with it, as you'll see a bit later. Um, I picked some source control. Obviously, I use Git and GitHub. Uh, naturally, I could have used something else, but I noticed that JSP was on GitHub and you guys were using Stardots use things on GitHub, so why not stick with it? So I got to work on it. Uh, have a move on to the next one. So, <clears throat> learning Acorn Atom. So I do remember, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to learn about the Acorn Atom. Um, when I was 12 or so, I got my BBC Micro. Uh, I saw a book in Dewey Smith's, this book here, which you can see. Um, it's got a lot of coding for BBC Micro, which is great. And I typed all these in over the years. But all of this Atom code that I tried to read and understand, but never got a chance to type it into anything. So I thought, well, at some point, I'm going to type this code in and see what it does. Um, and this is why, why it's, you know, 40 years later, here I am. So, oh, so the best resources I found were, I was going to put a line in here, I did have a line, but I've moved it, but it was just looking online. Stardot was a really good source, and I went to Hoglet's uh, Spore sites as well. I was just trying to find lots of sites about the Acorn Atom, about ATAP, obviously, the um, Atomic Theory and Practice. I read a lot of that now, so I understand a lot of things from there, and I've looked at the, um, the technical manual, so I understand a lot of that now. Um, but the first things I needed, before I really got to grips with trying to learn entirely how the Atom worked was just get JSB loaded up, get the Atom ROMs in the right slots into the JSB's architecture, into the memory slots, and then run it and see what happened. So I used the Atom Atomulator probably, I, I, I said that definitively, but I hadn't planned to write this talk when I was grabbing this code and grabbing these bits and pieces. So it might have been that it was from the main ROMs or something like that, I'm not sure. But I'm going to put down, I mean, Atomulator's got the source for those, so that's fine. Uh, so that was that's the first thing I did, get those ROMs. Oh so yeah, so here we talk about the technical manual. So just that's just a link because I, I, I searched the web and I clicked on any link that I found. And even now when I think, oh, what's the command I need to use here? I just use Google to search for it. Whichever the first one is on the list that I click on, it's not like any of these are definitive for me. But um, so I used, this is probably what I used. Um, so yeah, so I learned the internals a bit better. Um, the PPIA chip, the 8255, that controls the keyboard mainly. Graphics mode, tape and sound. So I needed this. If I'm going to do any Atom emulator, I needed to know how the 8255 chip worked. Uh, the 6502 does all the work um, at one megahertz. Obviously, that's half the BBC speed. So there's a couple of places, and I kind of blame Matt for this. He's just gone, oh, two, two million cycles here. You know, if you put it into a variable, I could have changed it. But um, I kind of turned all those two million uh, those values of two times a thousand times a thousand into actual um, a variable name, so we can use those throughout. I can change the speed a lot easier. Um, uh, the video chip six eight four seven again. I thought it'd be really similar to the six eight four five. It's only two letter, two numbers difference, isn't it? <laughs> but they are very different chips indeed, and um, they do very different things. The six eight four five is a lot easier really than the six eight four seven. I didn't really think about that when I started to simulate emulate it, because um, I thought that's going to need all those registers and tweaking the registers to move the, uh, the way in which the, the frame refresh works. doesn't have those registers, doesn't have anything really like that, any concept of those things. So it's a lot simpler chip. Um, two ROMs put into high memory, they were easily put in. You just place those in the same sorts of places that the BBC loads them up. The only difference I had to do was, I think all the ROM chips on the BBC Micro are at least eight kilobytes, somebody can correct me on this. Um, but the uh, ROMs on the Acon Atom can be four kilobytes, I think that's right. So you can do those little slots of 4 kilobyte ROMs. Might be right. Might be 16 and 8, not 4 and, four and 8. I'm not sure. Um, video memory is in a slightly different place on the Atom Atom as well. But it was useful to know where it was, as you'll see when I did the first run of the, uh, the emulator. I looked at the VIA chip, um, but it starts for use of supporting the printer and the user port. I wasn't going to support printers. I wasn't going to support user ports. So... VIA I could just ignore, although it's still in there, the, sim the chip's still there, but uh, in bit JSB, if anybody wants to try and use it, and try and think what it might want to use it for. Um, 
to maybe make it print out to a file or something or print out an image, a PDF, I'm not sure. So I didn't do that. Uh, so that's me learning the internals. So this is how I produce this emulator. So the first commit, I look back at my GitHub log. Uh, it was 2nd of February this year, back before we knew about face coverings and social distancing. And I'd never even heard the word furlough. Um, no, I don't think any of us had heard that word. Um, it was the first upload was just a complete copy of JSV. And as I said, my first, my initial goal was just to get the keyboard working and video output and for the CPU to execute in that kernel code and the basic code. Um, I thought it'd be a little while before I get the first version working. Actually, it works pretty much straight away. I think I got it running and it's, it jumped straight to that, uh, the last address in memory, that jumped straight into the kernel and then it started to run the code and it was trying to write stuff to um, a video memory. Um, I was really excited. Um, I tried to start, immediately started to duplicate some of the video code, uh, to write some of the video code. What I did is I duplicated the video code inside um, video.js because um, I didn't want to break the B JSB and break the BBC while I was hacking away at it. Uh, later on, I split that out into a 6847.js um, file, which I now run from there. So the latest version, you see, it's there separate. But initially, I was thinking, oh, I could just reuse this code and change some of the registers, it'll be fine. And that didn't quite work out, as I was hoping. I started hacking the VIA to replace the PPIA uh, because we use a, the BB uses a VIA. Uh, this uses this PPIA instead. The keyboard needs this. Um, so as I said, the f oh, I'll show you some pictures in a minute, but the first thing I noticed was we're having some woes with WebStorm. Um, I started running things, I thought I'm going to debug. I'd, I'd run it from, I'd press uh, run from within um, WebStorm and I thought that's going to run the J JavaScript code and it'll break at breakpoints I wanted. Um, I connect to it and fire the browser, I'll be able to step it through. I'm, always, I'm kind of an old software hacker, so I like to step through code. Um, I'm old enough to know that I've used a lot of print statements in my life as well, so um, I can work without a debugger if I need to, but I prefer the user of debugger. Um, I couldn't get a consistent debugging session, a lot of hangs, so it'd run and it'd just hang trying to connect the debugger to the browser. Uh, and I was just getting really frustrated and sit there for two or three minutes waiting for this connection. Then it would go, well, connection failed. So I did a bit of routing around on the web and people, nobody seemed to have the same problem, but ultimately I worked out that if I ran uh, my own session, not using my own server, and I use a PHP to run a local server and then connect WebStorm to that, that server could just be running all the time and WebStorm will connect and disconnect really easily. So if you ever have a problem with WebStorm connecting to its internal server that's that's the solution i don't even try to understand why it wasn't working but it didn't work and I did that. this does work really consistently so that's what i did so as i was saying that was just a bit of a uh, um, a segue or an aside there this is the first thing i did i ran the code i got um it got running it it, it immediately started to, uh, pushing data into the video memory and as you can see there it's got um the video memory starts at eight hundred thousand. Oh, 800,000, about 8,000 hex. Um, you can see 01 on the left-hand side. Oh, sorry, on the right-hand side, you can see 01, 03, OF, 12, 12, OE, 20. 20 is a space character in this character set. What 01 is the capital A, 03 is capital C, and so on. So and when I tried to write some, I very quickly started writing video code, uh, and all I did was just print the, the um, plot a pixel for the byte. So the, on the left hand side there you can see the, the first line, the vertical line is just the letter A and then the letter C and then the letter O, and letter R and then N and so on. And it's got the cursor. So I knew that something was getting out there really within you know a few hours. I knew something was working. Quite exciting. And on, you can see on the, the 8040 you can see the cursor there. I think that's the cursor. Yeah. So it's, something's working. I was very excited. So that was one of the easy things. So, but I, so I got distracted. Now, um, I, I got the CPU, CPU working, I dived straight into getting the PPI working. So as soon as I could get things uh, typed in, I could sort of see things working. You know, I could almost say type 10 print Andrew, speech marks Andrew, and then 20 go to 10 and then run, I would see things happening. So I wanted to get things typing in. So uh, PPI, PPI was next, CPU was working, that took like an hour. 
Uh, video code not working, but at least I can see something on screen. And I can always hack in and look at the memory because that, that thing you saw on the previous screen, that's um, JS Beeb's debugger on the right there. Show me that. But without the debugger, that wouldn't have been able to see that. I would have had to really look through the, the memory in, in JavaScript to see this. Um, and in the debugger in the web store. The PPI is also used for vSync, so I knew I thought I'd be using that later on for video. I can use prints to see if data is coming in through the keyboard, so I send the right signal. So everything started to come together really quite quickly. Uh, I thought I'd done the keyboard, but I think if you've ever written an emulator, um, <clears throat> you know that the keyboard is never really, unless it's a BPC emulator, um, but as soon as you're doing any of the old computers, the keyboard layouts are so varied. An Acorn Atom, Electron's Beebs, you know, the, Sharp, the little computer I used to use is a Sharp MZ80K. Um, that's got a really weird keyboard and the old pet chiclet thing as well. So that's really exciting. I wouldn't buy one of those pet chiclets. If anybody's got one of those, I'd love one of those. If you've got an MZ80K, I'd love one of those as well. Uh, talk to me about that. But yeah, so all the keys on a, on a modern keyboard are just all completely different, especially, especially control and shift are the other way around on a uh, Acorn Atom to a PC. Because when I've been playing games and control is up and shift is down, it doesn't quite make it right way around. And so I changed it so that, um, and the version I've got there, the physical keyboard on the, HJ, the JS Atom as it is now, um, shift is control and control is shift. Because that's correct for a PC when you do, sorry, correct for an Acorn Atom when you do the um, physical key, the original keyboard. But if you want natural, then it'll switch it around to the other way around. So if you ever try and use my Atom emulator and you're going, well, the shift key isn't working, shift key is the control key because that's the physical position it would have been at. So be careful of that. Keyboards are never done. Uh, oh, yeah. So the next thing I did was I wanted to get real text on screen. The SAA505 Teletext. Uh, emulation inside JSB has got the font in there so I just used that initially so the very first time I saw text on screen it looked like this it was just me taking the um, teletext font and using that so it's a bit odd but uh, if, you, if you know your Acorn Atom you began last well, a bit of a mixture of Acorn Atom and BBC um, but I wanted the real font obviously so I copied that from MAME they've got a big um, font table in there I just copied that converted it from C into JavaScript just as you know minutes job and um, you'll see the next slide has that on. Um, the next, I did pasting text. Again, I didn't want, I, I was typing coding now. I've got keyboard working uh, and it was sending things in. So I was typing code. Um, but I, that was a long time. So I found myself typing the same bit of code a lot of times, just things, just to see it drawing lines and, and so on. Because I wanted to set the graphics modes. So I got pasting text working. That was, again, that was pretty easy. Um, again, because JSB does it, it was, really saved me so much time. Uh, so I could edit text in a edit in a normal text editor and then copy it in, which meant, you know, you, you, we've all been there typing code into an Acorn Atom and wishing we could just go up and move around and add a proper text editor. Maybe there is a text editor in a ROM somewhere that I don't know about, but um, I'd love to get, uh, but, so that was a lot easier. Um, editing my code in, my, base, my Atom basic code in a text editor and then pasting it in. So here, I was trying to get the graphics mode working. Um, I got it takes, so there's the actual font now. Uh, I, I got uh, clear four working. That's the that's a two color high res mode. So there you go. That was it. That was me just pasting that code in. I didn't type that quickly. I just pasted some code in. Um, it worked quite quickly. It seemed to be going all right. Uh, that's meant to be on an angle. That's why it's looking a bit weird. I could probably can I rerun that? Choose that again. If you look at the code, if you quickly look at it, I might pause it at the end. Um, it does do it so it's like one angle. Um, so I compared this, what I was seeing, with uh, let me stop this now. Oh, um, with what it would do on the on another emulator, it's Acorn Atom, either main or on a Tomulator or on there's another one on Phil's place. There's a link down here, <coughs> which is something I found. But and it, it sort of works the same. So I was kind of happy with that. Um, I didn't have a real Atom. If I'd had a real Atom, I could have tested it on that. Um, so by February 21st, I had Atom working, I had the keyboard, I had pasting text, and it had uh, very rough graphics. Um, I used the Atomic Theory in practice for lots of basic programs. I copy and paste it in. Uh, I discovered some graphics mode accessible by writing a value to B000. I didn't know that existed until I started reading the documentation a lot more. And I've just noticed the time moving on. So I'm just going to keep rattling through. I'm going to stop at some point. 
Um, I spent a lot of time with those 6847 documents. Um, the, trying to get the graphics mode working was really hard. I looked at this data sheets, um, it talks about the 192 by 256 dots, and I learned those graphic, different graphic modes. The top six there um, are all handled by the font, so there's nothing you have to do about the top six, but the font coats with the big, big blocks. Uh, it's the bottom eight that you have to worry about if they're either clears one to clear four, uh, the top six are clear zero. And then to get the, uh, the color graphics modes, that's where you have to write a value into B000. Um, this, uh, we go, much of the cool stuff. So that's the first thing that I saw after I managed to get the graphics, well, get MMC loading up. I'll start, I've skipped a bit actually, the slides in the wrong place. Um, I got MMC loading it later on, and I used to run this program a lot. This is full color mode, just to see if it would draw the correct, um, the correct graphics for me. What have I got here? So I used to run that program a lot to try and see what's going on. And I also ran some games as well. I think Chucky I ran quite a lot to try and see if this looked correct. And it used to look wrong. So this is an early version where I've got the color graphics mode from. And I started to work out which of these which of these things on the MMC, on the, uh, yeah, the SD card image, used all the different graphics modes. So once I knew these were working, I could um, say that mode's working. So yeah, that's, I've skipped ahead on. I, but I had a lot of problems because I didn't have that initially, that MMC uh, code. So some of the things that I found, I think the documentation is wrong here. Again, somebody might prove me so if, if I'm, I'm wrong. But uh, if you look at the second row down on the left, uh, it says that the height and width of those pixels is three by three. Well, if I take 256 and divide it by three, I get 85 and a, th a third. Um, so I think that should be two uh, wide, not three pixels wide, or three, you know, is the width of that pixel on the screen. Um, to get 200, 128 pixels per horizontal row. Uh, the documentation on chapter 11 says it's 128, but it's saying it's three pixels wide. I don't know if that's any reason why that's saying it's three wide on the second, uh, second and third row there you'll see. It says, um, Sorry, can I point to it? Oh yeah, I point to here. So this one here says three wide, and this one says three wide. But I think it's two wide, actually a two and a two. Maybe I'm wrong. That confused me a lot. I was typing things in like that and going, well, why is this not giving me what I want? Um, so skipping forward a bit, tapes was next, because I got some graphics working. Um, remember, I didn't have, I was just, initially, before I had the uh, MMC working, I was just drawing lots of straight lines using code out of the, um, well, no, this wasn't useful, but after the ATAP the document, I kept copying code out of there, which would draw lines. And I could see the lines I'd be looking uh, jagged or missing parts of the line or uh, not looking, I'm supposed to be seeing a nice diagonal and it's looking at a, a shallow angle because I've got my widths and heights wrong. Um, so I thought I'll try and load up some tape because JSP did that. Um, it will also give me some of the software to try out. Uh, in hindsight, MMC would have been quicker, but if I had done that first, the MMC stuff, I would never have done tape. I don't think I would have done tape. It would have been one of those maybe in the future things, but I did it anyway. Uh, global pandemic kicked in, so I didn't really have time to, you know, other things were taking off, work took off a bit more. I had to kind of uh, do some exams for students. <laughs> I set some exams for students that were online now instead of just pen and paper. So um, once I did get back to looking at the tapes, these resources were really useful because um, I could disassemble the basic code that would load uh, things into, into, into the Atom memory. Inside the uh, kernel disassembly, I could look at how it was doing osb get to get date bytes out of memory, uh, off the tape. So I spent a lot of time looking at what that was doing, byte by byte. Um, which if you look at the source code, you might see some on, on GitHub, you'll see some of my comments in there saying, this is what's happening now, this is what's happening now, this is what the timing is here. Eventually I got it working. <coughs> um, I stopped on 24th of Feb, we finished 10th of March, so I got that tape working. I'm skipping around the times here, aren't I? There's um, a pandemic did kick in for a little while, a bit later. I could read data from the UAF, uh, JSP bus connection to tape, which pulls data into the ACA to gather the data, and then it kind of builds a byte inside the ACAI. Whereas the Atom just grabs data directly 
bit by bit and then builds it inside the kernel, inside the, inside the actual uh, memory of the acorn atom. So it's a lot, it's quite different. So um, you get that bit and then you set port C on PPIA. Um, I did it by reading in like a, a bunch of bits and then creating a byte and then sending that, I think. I can't remember how I did it now. I think I, I remember it was, I collected like a working bit, I think a working byte, and then sent that byte across. Uh, yeah, I think I did because that's set port C. Mm. Anyway, timing is really tight as well. You have to make sure everything's to the, because you're trying to send data to the, from the UAF to the CPU um, at the same speed, at same clock cycles that the CPU is expecting it to appear. Um, so that was quite hard actually in the end. Um, and so I needed to convince myself, confine myself that it was working. I had to hack the CPU code. So I put a bit of code in the CPU. So whenever it got to a particular location in the ROM and was right into a particular place, I could then see what byte it read. And uh, that's visible here. Um, I assume we're okay for time and somebody will stop me if I need to stop. But uh, I don't know if you can hear this. I'll put some sound on this. Uh, we, can't, we can't hear the sound. Um... Can you hear it now? Yes, yes, we can hear it now. So that's what I was doing, in, I was playing tapes, and because it doesn't do anything on the, the acorn atom, um, I was going, is there anything happening? What's going on? I don't know what's happening. So I spent a lot of time just making, putting lots of debug messages out so we could see what was going on. So uh, if you watch that, it's starting to say instructions. This is a game called Backgammon. How long is this going to take? Oh, we've got plenty of time, haven't we? I'm here till half two, it's fine, we're all here till half two. <laughs> we breathe it. Okay. So obviously when I tape and I echo an atom's finished loading, it just says done, this, that, run it. Um, it's going for backgammon that I had. So tapes were working, uh, and a few more slides to go. Okay, so MMC, we had a bit of a, a preview of that a moment ago. So I started developments again. So I had a bit of a break from the 10th to the 23rd uh, when lockdown properly started. We thought we knew this was coming, so I had to kind of get on with my teaching work. Uh, I've been reading the startup forums a lot more by then. I've been kind of hovering around startup, maybe not even logged in for years. Um, I'm a friend of one of the bit shifters guys, uh, Simon, who does the audio on bit shifters. So um, I talked to him a bit about this and he says, you know, he's got, he, I think he got me the BBC BI I've got now, but a good 15 years ago. Um, that's my old BBC, I sold to my, my uncle and I need to do it out. Um, so I could buy my toy ST. Um, so I've been reading startup forms a lot, learned about the Atom MMC at this point. I thought, right, I've got to get this in now because I know things are working, tapes working, videos sort of working, um, screening stuff. So I loaded in the modified kernel, loaded in the Atom MMC ROM, Run it. It's, it works. I mean, it would try and load stuff up, but there's no uh, response because it writes to a particular bits of video, uh, bits of memory. So from HTML, I set up a MMC, so it loads the disk into the emulator, and then it uses memory addressing to get data from that. Because it's just writing, it's writing to uh, the, the hardware. Started with star dot star cat, as you know. Uh, that. Got that working again by about 6 of April. I'm not going to go into the details, but yeah, just sit there, just going through the source code, looking at what is expected, as I can see what uh, Atomulator's got the code for the MMC, uh, writing and reading in there, so that's easy enough to work your way through that. And got that working, and then I could start loading that Atom software. And then once I started loading those games up, and the different things on that software arch archive, I realised I've got a long way to go with the video chip. Still, at that point, I still knew there was nothing things weren't working really as I thought they were. Um, so this is an early version of uh, me uh, loading Atom. I think this is the same one we just saw. Maybe. Yeah, it's the same one we just saw. <clears throat> but I played some games as well and it's had the same problems. So uh, around about then I thought, well, if I, if I publish it, I did get the graphics improved. And I thought if I publish it, then people will send me some uh, bug reports. So I put it on startup. Um, then everybody suddenly said, oh, have you not seen my emulator, uh, the flu uh, version? Um, and I'm glad I haven't seen those because if I'd have seen those, I might not have done mine. But then again, 
you know, there's some features of JSP that are really good. So probably, I think I still would have done actually. Um, started doing sound, uh, one bit sound again, it should be simple. Um, Again, I've just written down here dates because I think I was getting to the point where I was writing these slides. Oh, right. It's going to go over half an hour. So, and as it has, it's gone over half an hour. Um, <clears throat> main thing about the sound was, again, it's about the speed at which your, the CPU is writing bits of data uh, to the sound. Uh, something like a, a bit, that it, it, a flag that it changes, and that's going to make the sound go. Uh, it's just directly from the CPU to the speak loudspeaker. So you're sending that in software, you're sending it to, well, I'm sending it to a, a buffer that's writing that into a buffer and then that buffer is getting read at a certain speed from the browser. So the browser is pulling that data off and you're pulling that, pushing that data in and you kind of, the browser is buffering up data. So it takes a chunk of data that thinks I'll play this next. And you're writing stuff into a buffer that's going to say, so if I've got a double buffer that, so I'm writing into one buffer, then I switch them over and then the, um, the browser pulls that data off for its buffer to play it off. So, yeah, there's a lot of things going and they have to go in sync, otherwise it just doesn't work. And it still doesn't work, I'm still not sure it works properly. There's lots of clicks and, and blips every now and again. And it sits there even just, if you, um, if you load, up the load up the emulator in your browser, you'll hear lots of little clicking sounds and things. That's just the Atom, or is it the JavaScript? I'm not sure. If somebody knows anything more, great. I will try and fix it at some point. Um, and I spotted that I hadn't ever seeded the random number generator. That assumes that a block of memory on the Acorn Atom is just randomly seeded with, with random electrical values. So um, I loaded up a few maze programs on that um, uh, software archive, and the mazes were always the same maze. <laughs> I thought this was a bit odd, but it's always the same maze. So yeah, um, I discovered that I needed to randomly set some values in memory. So I must realize I should fill the whole of the Acorn Atom's memory with random data and then boot it up. You just there's only a small section really I think we need to do. Got the new archive in. As soon as the archives come through from uh, from Dave, I'll put them in as I, as I can. Oh, and I'd forgotten to put the floating point ROM in. I thought, well, why not put that in? So I'll put that in as well. That's just kind of just cut and pasted that in, and obviously this works now. Um, still fixing bugs. Um, this is, most recent was 21st July. It's still in the sound. That bug was that. Um, if you ran the emulator a few times, it went between BBC and back to the, the uh, back to the Atom. So I'm now, I should tell you now, I've, I've, I've kind of merged them now. Um, it would just not play any sound because it was almost like the the sound was set at one, and it, that would then because the way that it adds it combines sounds, it just adds the, the the value in together from all the channels on the BBC Micro on JSB. But I'd basically got my JS Atom not writing anything in, and it set it to one, so therefore nothing would play. So um, yeah, that's bug just in there. So I've um, made a new site called jsacorn.commandercoder.com. You can go on there and use the JSB and JS Atom together. I had a word with uh, Matt last week, and we said we might he's going to have a look at it, and might we might uh, just do a com it'll combine it into JSB at some point. Um, I do the SID emulation at so as well. I'm quite interested in seeing how that sounds. Um, I don't mess about with any of the URL commands, so I might do that. Um, so you can, because currently it tries to download the whole of the archive, the Atom archive, which is a couple of, I don't know how big it is actually, gigabytes. Um, and that takes a little while for it to download. If you're not going to be using the JSR, the software archive, the Atom software archive, then you've, you've got this thing downloaded you're never going to use. So um, I've switched it now so you can say Atom tape, and that will just do a, a vanilla Acorn Atom with no uh, other hardware in there. Uh, maybe disks, maybe the snowstorm, maybe the Godil. Don't know what Godil means, but maybe Godil. And that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, try it out. Um, send me your thoughts on Startup. I'll put bug reports into GitHub on issues. I'll um, go on there and I'll fix things as I see them. So that's me done. I might just put the emulator up on screen so you can see it. Can I screen, just change my screen share? New share. Where'd my new share go? Uh, I'll have to bring the browser up, I think. Okay, let's just stop this one. I'll stay somewhere, stay somewhere something else. Okay, I think I'm, I've tired you all out, maybe. So, um, your last point, um, you said you didn't know what Godel means. Yes. <laughs> it stands for good old jewel in line. All right. What does uh, it do? 
Uh, the Godel is an FPGA right. with, the, with its outputs matched, to, uh, to taken out to a uh, 48 or 40 pin dual inline footprint. Right. Uh, and a series of jumpers that allows you to put the power on the ground on any pin. So the idea is that you can emulate a, mm -hmm. a, a dual inline device, such as, for example, a 6847. Oh. So you, you put 6847 code in the FPGA, yeah. uh, target all the various outputs to the correct pins and configure the uh, uh, VCC and VDD with jumpers. Mm -hmm. And you can effectively develop a, a 6847 that you just plug straight into the Atom. Yeah. Uh, and with, with a couple of other leads, you can uh, add extra video RAM and put color and uh, VGA yeah. output and all sorts of things. Okay, because I'd, I'd seen that some of the archive said, oh, this works on Godel, and I was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> so I, thought, I don't know if I should support it or not. Well, well it, 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 <laughs> it, does, it, it, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> well, from a hardware perspective, you, you need a real atom to plug it into. Oh, um, or, or one of the replica atoms, there's a variety of different replica atoms knocking around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think to add support to it for your emulator would be uh, nice, but a, probably a fair bit of work. Okay, it will be very low on my list then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't have any questions in, in the chat uh, oh, at right. the moment, uh, but a few um, uh, comments. Uh, in terms of the 6522, um, so uh, some uh, people have used that as, a, as an input for joystick. Right. Um, yes. a, a, and uh, software can use the uh, hardware timers uh, in the 6522. Oh, okay, yeah. um, and if you were to add support for BBC Basic, to your emulator and there is a BBC basic add-on card I've seen that. Yes, I've seen which that. which adds RAM a sufficient RAM uh, and uh, and the support chip to the ROM mm -hmm. and that requires 6522 on board for a number of functions not least the time function in BBC basic uh, works off of the um, 6522 timer if I understand correctly yeah uh, um, but well, that 65522 chip is already in JSP, so it would just be, I, I like to say this, it's always sort of, uh, I think, also be easy. Um, yeah, that should be pretty uh, straightforward, let's put it that way. To kind of yes. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it should, yes, it, it should be. It, it genuinely should be, because yeah. it's just a question of just putting it in a different location from memory yeah. point of view. Um, um, and um, a, a comment um, uh, from <coughs> Phil Manrin. Uh, just drawing attention to his emulator um, and um, the, the link that you um, posted being somewhat out of date. So it's an old version of, right. of, of his. So I might actually... Phil's, Phil's place one. Yes, so, so he, he, he's, um, uh, he now owns the domain, the wonderful domain, econet.network. Oh yes, I think I've spoken about this one before. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll post that link into the chat when everyone goes back on to normal chat. Mm. Um, but I don't think um, there have been uh, any other questions okay. uh, from anybody else. But uh, what I can do now um, is, is say that if anybody else um wants to oh here we go i was just going to do the emulator i thought i'd give you a, a preview anybody who's never actually logged into the site and gone let's have a look at this this is it happening so it is, this is now jsacorn.commandcode.com has got uh, a new menu item acorn item acorn item so we click on that and then close and you restart and it uh, gives you the mmc there so you can load it everything and it should just play. So if you've never tried it, you're going to see it. In, in, in. I don't know if you're going to hear the clicking, but that's what I was talking about, the clicking. And something I use to test the sound a lot is um, the harpsichord. So I'm going to search for harpsichord. And this is the way I would test it the sound. Well, there was another program I'd run as well just to check it, but this is the way I knew it was working. So. And that's my, I'm not a musician, so that's it. That's what you're gonna get. Um, and then you just press the F12 to break. 
when you're in a game, you can play some games. So what we've got, uh, some remakes are good, three. And then we go along to uh, Chucky Egg's always good. Everybody loves Chucky Egg. I love Chucky. So you're going to see some of the faults there. So I mean, that's sort of showing you some of the stuff from the start. Don't use joysticks. And obviously, I've not put joysticks in. But I'm going to put joysticks in, and I'll do the 650. I'll do the 6502, 6522 input for this one. For the next thing. So uh, we've got some Chucky Egg action. It normally plays the blitz as you're moving around, but that's not going to be blitz. We've got to go to one there. Um, yeah, so it's a, if you haven't got an Acorn Atom, but you want to try some of the software um, in the meantime, then this gives you that option. And the ROMs work as well, so put the ROMs in, so you can choose uh, the ROM. Bags, what's that? I don't, I've never tried all of these, so I don't know. Uh, version Bag C manual. Uh, do we link to this? Let's just type it in. Bags. I'm not idea what I'm doing it. Okay. Maybe somebody who's got an atom can answer, answer a question for me, actually. I can do this. Right, well, well shall, I, um, shall I say that um, yeah. we'll open it up to, uh, to, to anybody. Um, yeah. I'll take the... Um, Let's turn this off. Well, uh, sh shall we leave your emulator running? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, well, see what, I'll, I'll leave that, I'll leave the... Um, so I'll unspotlight you and, and then... Um, uh, if, if anybody wants to uh, ask a question, if they can unmute their mic, and then, uh, as I said before, I, I ideally um, turn their video on as well. And if anybody's got any uh, um, observations or comments that they'd like to add in, uh, please do. Uh, we've got plenty of time until, well, I said we've got plenty of time. We've got about 10 minutes to go yeah. before uh, the, the next slot. Hi. Uh, Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a great presentation. I think uh, I must try it. Um, <laughs> I do have some questions about uh, you did say uh, not emulating the disk system. Yes. Uh, but the Atom has the 8271, same as the BBC controller. So isn't that easy <laughs> to <laughs> emulate or? Well, if it's the chip's already emulated, which I know it is, then yes, it'll be easy. It's just a case of, I think it's sometimes it's just my fear of getting sunk into a, amount, a large amount of time um, and testing. I think testing is actually the harder bit. But no, I mean, MMC took me a, a week or two maybe to do. I could probably do the floppy disk in a week or two if it was, seems interesting. The reason I put it off is because... Um, we've got not, not a lot of software there already on this this archive. If there's anybody's got other SSDs, I suppose, or SDSs. Well, if you look at uh, Phil's uh, emulator, mm -hmm. um, Phil has all the disk uh, images in his archive, okay. loaded as, as variables, and then uh, there is ROM, SD-ROM, uh, which uses uh, a disk image, uh, and you can emulate you can emulate a disk with it, with an MC disk image file. Sorry, you, you need slash atom after that, yeah. I do remember now, I remember looking at this one before when you sent it to me. So yeah, <clears throat> I'll have a look. I mean, I, I will, I'll do it. Yeah, and this, I'll, is, I'll, I'll this, is, uh, <laughs> this is this uh, is SDDOS, uh, yeah. which is used, and SDDOS uh, uses uh, an image file on the MMC, archive to uh, run uh, disk uh, to emulate disk uh, image yeah okay um there's nothing to stop me now it's uh, i've got plenty of time because <laughs> there's no because i say i work at the university uh so i'm now on a bit of a break so let's play that but this is something you, i want to be able to do with mine actually is to do we can do the command line i see where the urls are not supported so if i could do something where i can just also boot a particular image it'd be make the, the thing quicker uh, for people to download so is that being oh these press things on this one yeah so. so cool i'll play with that did you do sound at all is phil is phil like around or is it something that 
if you're talking about somebody else's system. Uh, I am around. <laughs> um, it supports VIA, uh, SSD images, the MMC, uh, the BBC Basic, but unfortunately, um, I still haven't got it around to putting <laughs> sound in. So maybe we could have a bit of a collaborative uh, yeah, coding yeah. effort on it. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge. We'll get who's going to get the, the, the best Atom emulator online? Me and you. <laughs> <laughs> Or is it for a challenge? Right, yeah, I'll do the other stuff as well. Then we can be uh, on an equal footing. Right, uh, any more questions, by the way? Uh, is this correct? You know when you go from, when you press, like see, now sometimes it does a big lot of kind of characters really fun flashing characters. Is that pretty standard for Nathan Atom? We well, it is when you switch uh, modes. You are that, going that. from a graphic mode to a text mode and then yeah. uh, rubbish is displayed and then after that the text mode is clear. So that's yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. I saw that and I thought that's a bit odd. <laughs> I think that looks worse because it's missing the V-Sync so it goes off the bottom of the TV and out onto the floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You now, some of this video, I tell you, the video and the, I, it's kind of, I did it just to get things working initially and then I, I'm thinking, oh, well, there's probably a few thoughts that people are going to go, well, this is terrible, you should have put a V-Sync in there and the sounds are all just nothing. I really like the um, TV image that you've used. <laughs> the, um, the border that appears is um, one of the functions of the 6847. Um, it, it just... Instead of the, the border being black, it will it, you can change the colour of the border. But yeah, um, yeah it's just a, a slight sizing issue on your canvas there, I think. Yeah, I think I mean, you can see it really clearly on the obviously that showed you on that tricky egg. Because uh, it, it's just, I've, as I say, I spent a lot of time in that documents for 6847, and it's, um, yeah, it's the border. That's it, yeah. Colors, yeah so. um, again, I tried to keep everything that was on the original um, JSB the same so i didn't mess with that so it's probably that the jsb had a big canvas and i put the tv screen there and i need to move now i need to move it around and move the actual image that's being rendered to the left a little bit and down a little bit so i think i could yeah just need, maybe just i'll scale it up a bit maybe just scale up the tv image a bit it's too small anyway i'll play around with that i have i have to say um i mean in some ways, the atom is quite simple. Yeah. Uh, it has a very simple schematic in its yeah. basic form, but it's quite an idiosyncratic computer. Yes. And I have to say, it's quite impressive to have developed an emulator like this of such an idiosyncratic computer without any access to the actual computer. Yes. Um, <laughs> because, um, you know, um, I, I can imagine that there are various things where you wouldn't, that uh, would have been helped by, you know, just taking a, oscilloscope and probing a few lines to see what yeah. actually happened. Well, as I said, I looked at, I mean, I, I didn't even know what the border thing was doing for a while. And I, I did all, all sorts of weird things. I'm going, that looks right. And then I'd look on, on another emulator. Well, I even found, um, I looked on um, YouTube videos of people playing games on the Atom and went, oh, that's completely different to what I'm seeing. I'm there <laughs> the actual Atom. I'm seeing a different thing. So, uh, yeah, so I did. Yeah, it's good we're in the 21st century. I think if I was trying to do this in 1995, I'd have had no chance at all. Yeah, we're doing even just a, a, a C-based emulator, you know, putting, putting in C or something like that, I would have had real difficulties. But the so, there's so many resources now. The, the other difficulty, which is very much an Atom thing, is there's no such thing as a standard Atom. <laughs> uh, it just, you know, <laughs> there might be the idea of what is a standard atom, but every <laughs> single atom out there has been hacked in some way. Um, and yeah. what is expected of an emulator today would include all sorts of um, various add-ons, yes. uh, which all work in, in slightly unusual ways. Um, so uh, th that also makes it quite difficult. Well, I've got to do this. What's that typing? Hang on. Oh, I've got to do that. Hang on. It's not going to work now, is it? This, if I push the wrong key, this is another thing. I'm, I'm sort of taking your time up. But if I push, because I press Control 2 instead of Shift 2 then, it now says Area 94. Is that pretty normal? No. Yeah. 
He loves stuff. Oh yeah, the guy, guy earlier was saying he doesn't use Facebook. Uh, he only uses Facebook, doesn't do Stardot. I don't use Facebook, so that's going to be fun. So, so uh, there's a question from Tricky here. Does yeah. your emulator support uh, um, up to an extra 32K of RAM? It could do because it's got a BBC Master kind of hidden under the hood. So I can the the, the, it's the JSB emulator and that's got the BBC Master built in. So the architecture that is that uh, that Matt put together, I'm just using the first like two kilobytes of it, or whatever it is, so the first sixteen kilobytes of it. So um, uh, well, yeah. it, it, it uses the thirty-two kilobytes. Otherwise, Jeffy Egg won't run. Yeah. So just using this, this, this small, like up until FFFF, so, but if you're talking, if the 32-bit, is it a add-on that pages memory in or something like that? I'm not really sure how it works, but I'm sure it could work something that would do it. Now normally, uh, zero, 00 until uh, 8000 is uh, 32K RAM. Yeah. Um, and nowadays, most people use that because you have a 32K RAM chip or, or add-ons. Uh, okay. uh, to fill that completely with RAM. Okay, yeah, that would be easy. And, yeah, and, the, and the, modern, the modern games, uh, like Jack the Egg, Raptor, and things like that, they use uh, that RAM. Oh, it must so be there. Already there. Otherwise, they don't run. Yeah, it's already there then. Because I just made it so that it's the same architecture that JSB has, and all of the RAM, all of the memory is RAM, unless it's tagged as ROM. And you could potentially make it all RAM, and you could be writing into the ROMs if you wanted to. You could do live kernel updates. I think there's a, a RAM test in the in the archive, so you can check it. Do you remember where it is? Uh, just search, do search on files. RAM, oh, RAM test R. Uh, there we go. That's yeah. yeah, but that's the. Do it so well. Right. Yeah, that, but that's that's just a RAM check to see if the data is okay. So it's okay. okay. Yeah, we have another one, but I, yeah, that's not on the archive to to check which memories are RAM and which memories are ROM. Right. Okay. Um, again, we could test it out at some point in the future. You know, if somebody wants to send me a message on um, on Stardot or even on yeah, I'll, I'll upload that. Email so we can test it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and just or just on here, just go on and test it. You can type it in, or I'll just we can load. It. If you, see, if you make another image, you can load a, your own image. So if you make a, a zip file with files on it, it's just a zip file, the SMMC. If you had a zip file with one program on it and then load it up, it'll find it. You can then and then that's, that's the Atom file or, or an X, a text file? Uh, it, whatever, it's just an Atom file, yeah. So you just make a zip file with that file and then load it here. And then the MMC is there. So if I do star dot here, star dot, Oh, that's there. <laughs> so I'm doing the star from the PC. Okay. Yeah, it gives the folders, and then you can just go like load, load uh, CD, CD. Uh, so. Star C W D. Oh, it starts. Yeah, so it's star C C, C W D. Change C working directly. Oh, yeah. So, and start up. Wow. You can load so just do it like that. Just make a zip file with the folders and files on, and then you can just load it up and run it. So it's pretty, pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> I think it's pretty yes, cool. It's nice. <laughs> nice. Ah. Did we copy? How do we do copy? There we go. Oh, that's no, wrong one. Oh, I've messed up now. Yeah, so I was saying about the keyboard's never done. It's never the same as the real thing. No, the, the, end, touch, the end key is normally. Uh, so yeah, so you can do, you know, you can load up from just from zip files. So if you want to test this out, just make a zip file with the files you want, and then just load the local file, and then it'll uh, you'll have to you'll be able to test it with all sorts of things. Can I just add something to what Robert said before about the uh, Atom being an idiosyncratic, um, simple machine? That's actually for educational purposes. That 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 makes it a very attractive machine because cool. it's um, it's easy to understand. Um, I watched a, pro, a, a presentation by the guy that 
designed the BBC Micro Motherboard, <clears throat> uh, which is a lot more complicated. But he was saying that 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 is sort of getting to the limit of what one person can hold in the head. But the atoms, very yeah. very simple, and um, yeah. yeah. I think it was, I mean, I didn't really mention in my slides, but one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because I've used computers since the BBC and I've used them right up to now. And um, when people say to me, it's magic, isn't it, how a computer works? I go, well, not really. <laughs> it's just a lot of very fast electronics going on, a lot of, of decision-making going on. And so we sort of, when you're sort of teaching it and say, this is what's happening inside a CPU, this is what the bits are doing. If you've ever been to the, art, the, the, the museum in Cambridge, that mega computer, the mega processor is amazing to see how it works and see uh, the bits of data moving through. And I wanted to do this because I wanted to understand how, um, how you would wire up a computer. When I built one when I was at university, a computer, and they built like from the chips and wired it myself. But yeah, for students to, I'd almost want us to be able to drag and drop the chips into place and get the students to visually wire them. And physically, should we do it physically then? Anyway, my kind of, come on. <laughs> that that was my um, uh, motivation for, um, for for writing it. Keys and I are actually <clears throat> um, off and on working on um, the eConnect side of things yeah. um, because uh, it'd be nice to 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 use it in a school environment yeah. and uh, maybe set aside a bit of online storage space. Um, <clears throat> because the Econet was, uh, you know, it was well ahead of anything that Microsoft and those were doing and oh, yeah. being able to send each other messages, you know, before mobile phones and that. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a great kind of link between modern stuff and, and old stuff, I think. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'd love to, um, yeah. yeah, I think I'd love to try and somehow work this into its education because, I mean, I teach undergraduates now and they, some of them come in, they've never even done computer science yet. A level or GCSE, so um, just to get them excited about how bits move. And that, one of the reasons I got out of, out of making video games is I used to hire people and you'd ask them to do some bits middling, you know, in code. Just we'll talk about bytes and bits, and they just didn't know at all. They had no idea what a bit was. They'd, they'd written in Java for kind of five or six years, but never written any, never knew what, you know, how the chips worked, right? So disappointed that we were losing that. Well, I think I'm going to have to go now. I, uh, I've got another event on. I've got a barbecue to go to. So uh, I'll have to say goodbye to you all. Well, that, that sounds marvellous. And thank you very much for uh, that presentation. Um, that, that's very interesting. It sparks a lot of debate. Um, and, and, and maybe we'll have uh, um, some input to it from others in terms of moving it forward. But thank you very much indeed for your time today. I'm still not, and I'm on my emails and so on. So just get in touch.